was brought back down to the ER because he's still going through a lot of pain right now. So, so he won't be here today, so we will be doing our best to fill in. So welcome to those of you who are here. We're glad you're here. Welcome to those who are on live stream. We're also glad you are here, though virtually. Um, so with that, we are going to go into our first song. It will be, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, number 48 in your hymn book, and the words will be on the screen as well. continue our reading of Psalm 119. So we're going to do 105 uh, through 112 together as a church. So uh, Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, I pray, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not strayed from your precepts. Your testimonies I have taken as a heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. All right, so next is announcements. So Eric is also not here this morning. So I'm sorry for the lack of humor in my giving of announcements. Uh, so first of all, at 5.30... Uh, this Wednesday, we're going to have dinner, right? Like usual, 6.30, Conqueror's Club, youth group, praise and prayer. And Lord willing, Pastor Brian will be feeling better by then. Uh, then, more importantly, this evening at 5 p.m., so we have our a service, well, actually an annual business meeting tonight at 6, but before that at 5, we're having our child safety training, right? So whether you're a member or not, if you, have, if you work or have worked recently in any capacity, um, with children, so anything from, you know, 18 and under, right? So if you've helped out with like youth group, maybe if you've chaperoned before, if you've done nursery, Sunday school, Conquerors Club, if you plan on doing VBS or ministries like that, um, it would be good for you to come to get that training. If you can't make it tonight at five, um, you have to contact Vic for the details because he will be um, leading that and then he can um, walk through that with you at a different time as well. Um, so it's something our church does. Uh, we try to do it regularly to keep up to make sure our church is a safe spot um, for children uh, to have ministries here. 
So that's at 5. And then tonight at 6 p.m., we're going to have our annual business meeting. All right, so we're going to go through kind of our last year, our 2020 report. We're going to look at 2021, kind of our, our theme, our focus for the future, things like that. We're going to look at some a financial report, and then uh, we're going to have a membership vote too. So this, this meeting is primarily for the members of the church. So if you are a member, I would highly encourage you to be here tonight um, to come so that you can know what's going on in our church and also for the voting parts as well. It's important to have the membership and attendance for that. And that's tonight at 6 p.m. Okay, and then um, next Sunday, so Daryl Fryer, who's one of the missionaries we support, he's the camp director at Bass Lake, um, at Bass Lake Baptist Camp. That's kind of the camp for our organization of church. So we're part of the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches, um, the GARB, and this is our GARB camp. Um, that our church supports. So he'll be here uh, next Sunday all day. So he'll be preaching or teaching in the Sunday school, the morning service, and the evening service. So he has it all um, next Sunday. So make sure you come out to get an update on how the camp's doing and to hear him preach because he's um, quite good at preaching. So I'm sure that will be edifying for us. Also next Sunday evening at five, we're going to start choir. So if you have ever had any inclination to singing at all, come on out, join the choir. Right? We can always work and grow and get better. So that's always a fun time. Um, so we'll start that again this next Sunday evening at 5 p.m. So then our marriage ministry, which we had in the cold yesterday, not outside, but inside, um, we'll continue. We'll have that again, session number four, on this our Saturday, January 30th. Right, So not this next coming Saturday, but the one after that. We'll be doing session four. If you've missed the first couple, please still come. Right, every lesson is applicable to uh, whether you've missed the first couple or not. And if you did miss the first couple and you'd like to get um, the DVDs so that you and your spouse can watch through those to kind of get caught up, um, just come and talk to me and we will make sure we get you the DVDs so that you can watch those on your own as well. And then we have a youth event coming up um, on the 30th of January as well. So that Saturday, we're going to go sledding, um, and then we're going to have a meal afterwards. So we'll meet at the church at 1 p.m. We'll go sledding for a couple hours. Uh, we'll come back. We'll have a spaghetti dinner here at the church and then play some games. We should be done somewhere around the 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, range for that. So kind of keep that in your calendar, parents, because I know the kids will forget. Uh, so make sure you make a note that we're going to do that on the 30th. And then our last thing is we do have an offering box um, on the entryway table, right? There's also a mail option and an online option. So if you feel inclined between you and the Lord to give, um, that is where the offering will be. So now let's um, pray just to open us up, to get us our hearts in the right mode as we enter into the service and as we continue to sing. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for um, your word, even as we are reading as a church, Psalm 119, uh, just the focus on your law. Father, your perfect law and also on your word in general. Lord, help us to, to love your word. Help us to study your word, to be growing in the knowledge of your word, Father. And we're thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit to better understand your word as well. Lord, we pray for this service that our hearts will be prepared, that we will have um, dealt with any sin that's within our hearts before coming so that we can um, worship in joy and peace here this morning. Lord, we ask you to continue to bless and work through this church. Father, um, as we worship in song, as we worship in giving, the public reading of scripture and the sitting under the teaching of your word, Lord, that we would be ready to honor you this morning, to grow in our faith, to edify one another with the use of our spiritual gifts as a church. So we're thankful for your blessings upon us um, as we continue our service, and we ask for your help and guidance this very morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So our next song we're going to be singing is hymn number 68, Holy, Holy, Holy.
So next we're going to spend some time in prayer for our countries and for our missionaries. So there's um, another mission report on the back table. Um, so if you didn't grab one on the way in, don't all run back and grab one now. But you can grab one on the way out to kind of help you remember um, for this week who we're praying for. So we're going to be praying for um, Beth Trimble this morning, who's one of our retired missionaries. And then there's an unreached people group that we're going to be praying for this week as well on the back of the card. Uh, so Beth Trimble is a retired missionary um, to Brazil. So her and her, her and her late husband um, planted a few churches there in Brazil. We've been supporting them for many years. A couple years ago, her husband passed away. Um, but she is now recently married to Fred Trimble. So same last name. Um, so now they, her and her husband Fred are living in Springfield, Ohio right now. Um, so it's important, I think, that we support retired missionaries. Um, because a lot of time these missionaries give their whole life for the field, right? They may not have retirement accounts or sometimes the mission agency will go under and all the retirement they had will be gone. Um, so they'll give their life to the field and it's hard for them to retire from the mission field and then have no support or no way to earn income um, when they're back here in the States. So we have a handful of retired missionaries that we support as a church um, here at Faith Baptist, which is always a blessing to them and a blessing to us. Um, so some prayer requests for um, Beth and her husband. They both had recently had COVID. Um, their symptoms were mild, praise the Lord, and they ask for continued prayer for good health. And then they are both going down to Florida to help her sister's in law or her sister in law's husband, who's in the hospital with COVID right now. So they're asking for wisdom on kind of how long to stay and how they can best um, be helping him. And then the last prayer request is how they can serve in their local church. So now that they're back from the missionary, they are faithfully part of a local church there in Ohio. Um, so just wisdom on how they can best be using their spiritual gifts within the context of the church there. They're also housing three young people too um, that they have living with them right now. So you can be praying for those three young people as they minister to them and what's going on there as well. So then on the back page, we have the Balti people in India. Okay, so you have kind of a, a helpful table there on the right that kind of has the breakdown, right? So they're in India, they're part of the 1040 window. Uh, their population within India is about 52,000, but their global population of this small tribe is 99,000. Okay, so they have about seven different villages that they live in, kind of in some dangerous areas um, in the mountains. So it's very difficult to get to them because you have to go into the mountains, the weather is not great, and also, uh, when you have smaller people groups that are kind of more secluded, uh, they tend not to be very friendly to outside people. Um, so ways that we can be praying for these or for this group of people here in India is that um, they would be hospitable and willing, that the Lord would work in their heart for outsiders to come in or even the native people in India, um, whoever the Lord raises up to go and reach these people. So be praying for, um, for this people group. So they only have portions of the scripture in their own language right now. So um, may the Lord use um, those sections that they have uh, to reach these people for the gospel. Um, so let's pray for our missionaries and for our country. Dear Father, we're um, thankful for who you are. We're thankful you're on the throne. Um, Father, that you have um, set the earth up. Father, you keep it, everything working um, simply by your presence and by your sovereignty. Lord, as you are enthroned in heaven, and we're thankful for that, and we come humbly recognizing who you are, Lord. Um, we're thankful for your love for the nations. Uh, Father, that you didn't send the 12 just to the Jews, but to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Lord, we're thankful for you grafting the nations um, in, Father, into your plan. Lord, and even the open doors for the Gentile nations in the Old Testament as well. Lord, so we see your heart for the nations. Father, we know that you desire um, people from all tribes. To come to you lord we know that in heaven we'll be worshiping with people from every tribe tongue and nation and that's a beautiful picture fathers so we pray for the balti people in india lord that you would raise up missionaries that you would equip them train them to live in the mountains to pour out their lives in order to see this people group come to the saving knowledge and faith in the lord jesus christ father so we ask um, that you'd be doing that work and working in the hearts of these people through the holy spirit lord uh, we pray for Beth Trimble as well. We lift her up and her husband, Father, that they would have um, continued good health, Lord. And even though they're not on the mission field anymore, they still have spiritual gifts, which you've given to them, and they can use those to minister to people in their local church, Lord. So open up ways 
uh, for them to be ministering to those around them and to the three young people staying in their home. Lord, give them wisdom as they travel to Florida um, to help with her sister-in-law's husband, Father, and pray for health for him as well as he's in the hospital with COVID. Lord, that he would reco recover quickly and not have uh, lasting side effects um, from COVID-19. Father, we lift up our country as well with inauguration coming up, Lord, the unrest in our country. Um, I pray that we as Christians will have a heavenly mindset, Lord, that we'd be focused on the things of God, Lord, and living as citizens of heaven. Father, for we're citizens of heaven first and then citizens of the country second. Lord, but help us to be good citizens of this country, to uphold um, the Constitution, to uphold the law, Father, and when it coincides with your word, Father, with what you've laid out. Help us to not uphold what is evil, Father, but to uphold the things that are good. And we pray for those in office that they would not be um, passing laws and things in which would, in a sense, glorify things that should be shameful, Father, which our country is so quickly doing. Lord, so we ask for um, the gospel to sweep the country, Father, to even start in this area, start in um, this local Duluth area over in Superior and Esco and Cloquet. Lord, use this church to be faithful witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ to reach the lost. Lord, and we pray that um, through the power of your spirit, through the power of the gospel, that this nation would be changed, Father, and the hearts would be changed and turned towards you. So we're thankful um, for your blessings upon us, that we have the freedom to worship. Lord, and we lift up these requests in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So our next song and our last song for this morning is going to be Speak, O Lord. So if you would stand and sing this song with me.
morning, everyone. Scripture reading today will be in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 to 20. Let's begin. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Junior Church is dismissed. You can turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. So starting in verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as, how, as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual morality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So in light of the reading of God's word, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you with a, um, a text that is difficult, Father, but we're thankful for your word. Lord, we're thankful for all that is within it. Help us to glean um, spiritual truth that we can apply to our lives from this. Help us to unlock um, what Paul meant when he wrote this to the Thessalonians. Lord, help us to live after the example um, of the Apostle Paul and even the example of the Thessalonians, um, the wonderful and evangelistic example that they set um, in that church there. Lord, so guide us this morning as we walk through and continue on in our journey through this book. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been going through uh, First Thessalonians uh, slowly but surely. We're working our way through this book. Um, and last time we looked at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 4. So today we're going to finish off 4 through 8. So we're going to tackle that section. Um, but just in, in light of review, we can keep in mind that this book is overwhelmingly positive. Right? As I was reading through this, even just again this morning, it just flows all the way through chapter 3. Right? If you took out the chapter breaks in 1 Thessalonians, you'd get all the way through the first three chapters and not even know that there's a change in thought because Paul is just overwhelmed with joy for this church. Right? So he was there briefly, and because of persecution, he had to leave. He was driven out of Thessalonica. And then he sends Timothy to get a report on how the church is doing. Right? Just as Pastor Brian, when he's gone, wants to know how everybody's doing. Right? I'm sure he, he's not in the attitude of, oh, 
Thank goodness I'm not with that church. Oh boy, who cares how they're doing, right? He cares about each one in this church and he cares about how you're living and how you're doing, right? So when we're removed from the church, there's still that care, there's still that love. So Paul was worried because if they persecuted Paul, and now that Paul's gone, who are they going to turn to next? The church that's there, right? So persecution will oftentimes start with the leaders and then it'll keep working its way down to every single believer in the area. So Paul's worried that the Thessalonians might walk away from the faith. He's worried that he might have labored in vain, that even though they showed that they received the gospel, maybe in their hearts they truly didn't. And as soon as things get hard, people walk away. One thing we know about persecution in the church is that when persecution ramps up, it typically weeds out the church. It typically cleanses the church down to its core or the minimum of the true believers that are still standing faithfully. We've seen this throughout the thousands of years of church history, right? That when times get hard, people tend to walk away. We see that with Israel as well. When God's blessing them, they're entering the land, everybody's for the Lord, but as soon as things start to get a little hard, they start to turn away, right? And there's usually only a remnant that's left. So Paul has that worry for this church, right? The burden of the church was heavy on Paul. And when he's writing to the Corinthians, when he's listing all the physical things that he's went through, whether being beaten by rods, even being stoned, right? Having 39 lashes or 40 minus one, right? Well, he was shipwrecked and he was floating in the, in the sea for a day and a night. On above of all of that, at the very end, he says, and the daily burden of the churches, right? Paul had a spiritual burden, a mental burden, an emotional burden for all the churches that he's planted. For these believers, how are they doing? Are they being discipled? Are they walking in the faith? Right? They didn't have quick communication. Um, he couldn't just send a text or send an email to Thessalonica and see how everyone's doing. Right? He couldn't watch the live stream. He had to abandon himself. Right? So he had to leave himself alone in Athens, surrounded by all these idols and all these pagans, to send Timothy to see how this church was doing. Right? So Timothy comes back with a great report, and then he writes this letter. All right, so Paul's just overwhelmed with joy that they're standing fast in the faith. All right, we see that especially in, verse, er, in chapter 3 as he's kind of building up. But then, just like any church, doesn't matter how well we're doing, there's always things that need to be improved. All right, so Paul gets here to chapter 4. All right, in chapter 3 at the end, he spends some time praying. And right, he says, even in verse 10, As we night and day keep praying most earnestly, that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Right? And he says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. That we, that, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people just as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So here Paul kind of ends this section. And now he's going to move into, after his prayer, of completing what is lacking in their faith, right? Um, even when a church is doing well, even when we're doing well, it's not enough to just say, good job, right? God doesn't like flattery. We shouldn't just flatter each other and say, oh, you're doing great, and just kind of build up their ego, right? What we want to do is we want to encourage. Now, we don't want to always be pessimistic. We want to love one another, encourage one another, but also push them further, Right? When somebody, for example, in track, if somebody is running the 400 meter dash, the worst possible race that has ever been on the face of the planet, um, when they're running around, when they're getting to that third corner, that last 100 meters, right, and they're giving it everything they got, the coach doesn't just say, yep, good job, you can stop now, right, at that last corner. No, he says, good job, you're doing great, keep going, keep running. In the words of Paul, keep persevering, keep striving for holiness, keep walking worthy of your calling, right? A good coach keeps encouraging the runner or the athlete to keep going. They don't just say good job in the middle of a game and leave it at that, right? They, they say good job if you're doing well, and then they encourage you to keep going. So Paul's doing that here. He said good job in the first three chapters. And then in chapter four here, now he's going to start, he's going to tackle a few different topics, the first of which... He's going to tackle sexual morality, the second of which he's going to talk about a Christian's daily life, how we should work, how we should interact with one another within a community of believers. And then he's going to end with the main topic of the day of the Lord, when Christ returns. So he's going to talk about the coming of Christ. And then the very last section, um, Paul gives all these what are called staccato imperatives, right? So if you're a musical person, when you hear staccato, those are quick notes. 
right? You're not holding out a note with staccato. That would be legato when you hold it out. But staccato, you're hitting them really quick, right? Maybe we even had some in there. Maybe you couldn't hear it. But So Paul goes through this list of things that we could spend days on and just hits all these quick things right before he ends his letter. So we tackled one through three in chapter four last time. So we looked um, at an introduction on sexual morality. We looked at the etymology, meaning what the word itself means, kind of the origins of the word. We looked at the biblical usage. And we also looked at the effect and how pervasive it is in our culture and in the churches today, right? Remember, we shared the, st the statistics that upwards of 50, 60% of people within the church, which is the same as unbelievers, are actively once a month um, in some sort of sexual immorality, right? So in this topic within the, within the church in America, we look no different than unbelievers, just as a general statistic, right? And that's a problem. This is something that's been increasing more and more within the church and within our culture, especially over the past 10 to 20 years, something that we need to continue to fight and tackle. So one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Right, and that's what we're going to see in this text, that we need to be self-controlled over our own body. We need to have control over ourselves. We need to not, like it says the Gentiles do, just be driven by our passions. That whenever we feel a certain way, well, we're just going to go that way. Right? Through the Holy Spirit, we need to have control of our bodies and self-control. We see this in um, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul says, but I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So Paul says he disciplines his body. Now, he's not talking about a physical discipline. And again, history, that has, this text has been used that way of Christians beating themselves to bring their body in discipline. Now, I think that is a vast stretch further than what Paul had in mind. But we need to keep ourselves in discipline. We need to keep our physical body to ourselves and under the control of our mind and the Holy Spirit. Right? That's an essential. So for the purpose that we may not be disqualified. Right? And this is especially important for pastors and those in leadership, right? like Paul was. He did not want to be disqualified from the ministry based on the qualifications that the Lord gave to him that he wrote to Timothy and Titus, right? of the qualifications of elders, pastors, and bishops, and so on. So the, even though we're only tackling four verses this morning, verses four through eight, there's four different sections that we're going to break this text into. The first one is verses four and five, which is about possessing our own vessel. We're going to talk about what that means. Verse 6 is God's judgment. Verse 7 is our calling. And then verse 8 is God's divine command. So those are the four sections uh, that we're going to tackle as we walk through these four verses this morning. So the first section, possessing our own vessel in verses 4 through 5. So it says that each of you, so first in verse 3 says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. We get a very clear statement from Paul that if you want to know what God's will is for this area of your life, it is to abstain from sexual morality. He says it very clearly, this is it, this is God's will for you, right? And then in verse 4, he starts to kind of flesh that out of what that looks like and says that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So this first phrase, possessing your own vessel, this has been um, debated for many, many years of what this actually means. The earlier interpretation of possessing your own vessel was referring to your spouse, right? So in 1 Peter 3, 7, we see that the wife is referred to as a vessel. And this is what the majority of what the early church would have held to in this interpretation, is that this means possess your wife, which means basically be faithful to the one whom you have. Now, I do not think that's exactly what this text is getting at, but that is one of the interpretations that has been given. Most others now, especially from around the 15, 1500 onward, have held that this vessel we're talking about is our own body. So it's not saying possess your spouse with sanctification and honor, but possess your own body. Live in your own flesh with sanctification and honor. The reason I think this um, example or that this interpretation is better than the one of possessing your wife as your wife is the vessel is because of how this word vessel is used um, in the Greek and especially when in the Septuagint, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but also it has a much wider application, right? Paul in many other places has talked about husbands and wives. He's very clearly has mentioned the word wife. It would be very unique for Paul to 
talk about husbands and wives everywhere else in the New Testament in his writings, and then in one weird spot refer to the wife as a vessel. Right? If maybe if Peter wrote this, that might fit a little bit better because Peter does refer to the wife as a vessel, but Paul never does. So that's unlikely usage of what Paul's getting at here. And it would have a much broader application if this was referring to our own body. Right? Because then this has application for married couples, husbands, wives, and also for singles. Right? Where, whatever situation you're in relationship-wise, you are to possess your own vessel with sanctification and honor. So this is the majority view um, as of right now, and I think this is the biblical view of what Paul is getting at here in possessing your own vessel. Right? In 1 Samuel 21, 5, David, um, or as Samuel's writing talking in this text, um, David, and when he's talking, is referring to the body as a vessel. And in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew with a little Aramaic, Aramaic thrown in there just for fun, and the New Testament in Greek, right? But, you know, not the, the whole world couldn't read Hebrew. Even Jesus, when he's quoting scriptures, is quoting from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So the same word of possess or of vessel that's used in 1 Samuel in the Septuagint, in the Greek, is the same word that's used here for vessel. So kind of giving a language link um, to the fact that this is talking about our own body, not um, our spouse. So we are to possess our own body, and then we have the next phrase here, in sanctification and honor. So Paul's not just saying, yep, have control over yourself, but you know, now that you have control, do whatever you want with your body. Right? Because, you know, you can have unbelievers who say, well, you know, I have control over my own life. I choose to drink. I choose to do drugs. I choose to go do this and that. Right? And in a sense, yeah, they do have possession over their own body. So if Paul stopped here, then there wouldn't really be much application. There wouldn't be much difference from believers and unbelievers. But Paul goes on. He says, not only have self-control over your own body, but do so in sanctification and honor. Our bodies need to be controlled in a way that exhibits sanctification and honor and in a way that pleases God. That is how we ought to be disciplining ourselves. That's how we ought to be controlling our own vessels or our own bodies. So in order to do this, we need to be separate from sin. And in this direct context, we need to be separate from sexual immorality. Right? If we want to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor, you say, well, what does that mean? Abstain from sexual immorality. It all goes back to verse 3. Okay, Paul's clear command. So in 1 Corinthians 3.17, we see that our bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit, right? We talked about this last time, that just in the Old Testament, you would never bring a prostitute or a harlot into the Holy of Holies. First of all, God would strike you dead before you even got there, but that would be unthinkable, right? That would be unthinkable to that. Once they started bringing idolatry into the temple, that's when in Ezekiel we see that the temple was destroyed. We see the glory of God leaving the temple when that happens. So now in the New Testament era, we no longer worship in a temple, right? This is not a temple. There's nothing special or holy about these actual walls, right? We now, our bodies, every individual believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so in the same way, Paul's building on this language, and as Jared read in 1 Corinthians 6, that the temple of God in yourself and your body has no place for sexual morality, right? It would be the same thing as bringing that person into the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament as if you're doing it now, even if it's in private, because your body is now the temple and you're supposed to keep that with sanctification honor, with cleansing. The same, this holiness picture that we've had in Leviticus with Pastor Brian preaching through, that is the picture that you need to have for your own body because you are now the temple. Right? So try to think when you're reading through the Old Testament, when you're reading through the law of God, think about all these external things they did, all they went through, so that they wouldn't even mix the holy things with the common things. And as believers, we ought to live the same way. We should do our best not to mix the holy things, our own body, with things that are common or unclean. To stay pure, and remember the priests had to stay pure so that they could worship the Lord. We need to stay pure so we can worship the Lord as well. We do not want to be coming into church, coming into prayer, coming into reading God's word, right? The singing of songs, whatever it may be, in a state of impurity and in a state of sin. Especially when we're partaking of the ordinances, 
Right? We have, the Christian church has two ordinances. Right? We have baptism being one, and the other one's the Lord's table. Paul makes very clear in 1 Corinthians 11, if you approach the Lord's table in a state of unrepentant sin, one of the consequences is physical death and sickness. Paul says, this is why many of you have died. So people in the church have actually died, and Paul says, you want to know why they died? Because they approached the Lord's table in a state of unrepentant sin. They were mixing the holy and the common. They were undefiled, just as 1 Peter says, we are now the holy priesthood of God, believers, and they have defiled themselves and have come to the table. They're partaking at the table of immorality and pagan worship and idols, and then they're coming to the table of the Lord on the Lord's day. And Paul says that is not how it should be. So in Thessalonians, he says the same thing. Possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Right, so one of the early church fathers, Ambrose, he says, Let there be no immorality and uncleanness in the servants of God, because we are the servants of the unblemished Son of God. Just as Christ is holy, and since we're the servants of Christ, we also should be holy. Right, Matthew Henry says, It is the will of God in general that we should be holy. Because he that called us is holy, and because we are chosen unto salvation through the sanctification of the Spirit. And not only does God require holiness in the heart, but also purity in our bodies. And that we should cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, both of flesh and spirit. Right? So he kind of weaves together some of these in, in verse 8 and 7 here. Kind of this calling that we're called for holiness, not for sin. And he kind of weaves those together saying this is the will of God for our lives. That we be holy in everything that we do. Right? So this same sin, sexual immorality in Ephesians 5, 3 and 4. It says it's not even to be named among the saints let alone in today's culture where our statistics within the church is the exact same as the unbelievers, right? Paul says it shouldn't even be named among you, right? This shouldn't even be a possibility within the church because we should be holy and separate from the world. Right? This sin causes um, many destructive things, especially within ourselves, right? Um, Augustine, another early church father, he was somebody who is probably one of the most famous of the early church in about 350 to 430 is when he lived. And one of his struggles before he was a believer was sexual morality, right? He lived with a mistress for up to 13 years and even had a child with her um, before he was a believer, right? And he was traveling the lands and he had a faithful mother, Monica was her name, and she followed him wherever he went for those 13 years and did nothing but pray for him and his salvation, right? And then when he was converted, he was being sanctified. But even in his early stages of conversion, he said, Lord, give me chastity, but just not yet. He wanted to keep living in that, even in that, those early stages, right? So he endured this a lot. He's went through this himself. So what he says is such lust does not merely invade the whole body and outward members. It takes such complete and passionate possession of the whole man, both physically and emotionally, that what results is the keenest of all pleasures on the level of sensation, and at the crisis of excitement, it practically paralyzes all power of deliberate thought. So what he's getting at here is, when you're indulging in sexual morality, he's saying it paralyzes all power of deliberate thought. You are not thinking in your right mind, let alone thinking in accordance with God's word and what the Holy Spirit's leading. He says, this sin is so dangerous, it ensnares you quickly. And it takes passionate possession of the whole man. The, your whole being becomes consumed in this pleasure, in this immorality, that you can't even get one single clear thought out. You're not thinking clearly, it possesses your whole body. So just as in Thessalonians, Paul says, possess your body in honor and sanctification, sexual morality possesses your vessel in the exact opposite, in dishonor. Right? It corrupts your mind, it corrupts your thinking. It corrupts your actions, everything you do, right? And this is his firsthand experience with this, right? So this is a very dangerous thing. So then in verse four or in verse five here, he says, not in lustful passion. So to make himself really clear, possess your body and sanctification and honor. And then verse five, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Right, so the Gentile view, the pagan view of the body, right? This is an early, um, early kind of Gnosticism, Gnosticism or Docetism that's kind of flowing around here that hasn't been fully fleshed out. But it's the view that basically matter, right? The thing, the physical is evil, right? And things that are spiritual, the spirit things, the intangible, the immaterial, those are good. But they're separate. 
They have no mixing with each other. This led to the issue of basically Christ was not actually real flesh. He just gave the appearance of his flesh. Right, which could have been what John was combating in the early 90s and when he was writing First John, kind of an early view of this. Right? He focuses on, I, we saw Christ, we touched him, we fellowshiped with him. Right? So the Greek said, you know what, I can do whatever I want, any amounts of sexual morality with my body, and it doesn't matter because it doesn't touch my spirit, and you know, the matter is evil anyways. So I can be perfectly spiritual on this side because my spirit's good, and I can be perfectly immoral with my body because you know, it's my body and it's separate. So... Paul, in this, uh, he says, do not possess your body in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. So he's saying, do not follow their suit. Do not follow um, the Greek philosophy. Do not follow the thinking or what's common at the time. Remember the quote from last time, even this was from 300 BC, right, saying, mistresses were for the daily care of our body, right? A woman on the side was for our own pleasure, and then wives are to bear us legitimate children. Right, he said, so you better, if you want to be a, a well-rounded man, you better have three women in your life. Right, that was the common thinking. That was 300 years before Christ. Think how that's developed now in this period. So Paul's kind of dealing with this. And remember, the Thessalonians, this was not a Jewish community. Right, these were often, these were pagans. Because like in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, How you turn to God from idols to serve a true and living God. They were previously worshiping idols. So Paul tries to make this distinction here. Don't be lost in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. Right? Because as believers, right, in Galatians 5.24, we've crucified the flesh in its, in its pleasures. We, are, we died with Christ. We are risen with him. We are a new creation. Right? So we've been made new. We've been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. We have all these pictures of us being a new person. Now, that doesn't mean the flesh is completely gone away with. Right? We see Romans 7, we see there's still a battle with the flesh, even as believers, as Paul indicates there. Let's absorb in this text and get the full picture of how pervasive and how damaging sin can be for the church and for everyone around you. Verse 1, it is actually reported that there is immorality among you. An immorality of such a kind does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you were assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people, I did not mean, I did not at all mean with immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person, covetous, an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So Paul, he's hearing about there's this sin in the church, and rather than the church mourning over the sin and dealing with it, they're just going about their business. They're just allowing sin in the church. And Paul says this sin isn't even named among the Gentiles. Like the, the pagans even look at this and say that that's off limits, right? That somebody is with their, their father's wife. So probably a stepmother here and a son is what's in picture. And he says, remove the person. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? It doesn't take much leaven in bread to make the bread rise. Just a little bit ruins the whole thing. And Paul's saying, it's Passover time. Christ is our Passover sacrifice. Let us celebrate, but not with sin. We need to deal with this. He says, I've judged this person even not being there. And then at the end, he talks about, it's not our job to judge unbelievers. 
we shouldn't judge those that are outside the church. And he says God judges them. Right? Our only job for people outside of the church that are not believers is to share the gospel with them that they might become believers. But he says, is it not those in the church whom you're supposed to judge? He says, it's the fellowship of believers that we need to hold accountable out of love and deal with sin. Right? It's not loving to let somebody walk off a cliff. The loving thing to do is to go run after them and tackle them so that their life is saved. Right? So Paul says you need to deal with sin. The first words that Jesus ever gave to the church was Matthew 18. The first thing that the Lord Jesus Christ himself said about here's what you should do in the church is Matthew 18. Right? Keep the church holy. Because who builds the church? Christ does. He says, I will build the church. Your job is to keep it holy. Right? So back in 1 Thessalonians now, we should not transgress or defraud our brother in this matter. Sin never only affects you. It affects everyone around you. That's why it's even more important that you examine your life and deal with the sins that are private in your life that nobody knows about. Because eventually, they will, not become, they will become public. Right? If you continue to live in individual sin that's secret, it'll eventually become public. And then other believers lovingly should come aside one another and help you out. Right? To pray with you. To hold you accountable. But deal with it now. Kill it now. Don't let it get to that point. Um, because no, it's affecting those around you. And then Paul goes on, he says, Because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. This is a serious thing. God will judge this. The Lord's the avenger in these matters. Right? And this is specifically, I think, talking about Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 talks about how we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? We know that God will judge sin. We see that in Hebrews 13.4, talking about the marriage bed. The marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Right? We see that picture in Galatians. We see that in 1 Corinthians 1, talking about these lists of sins, one of which is sexual morality, the other drunkenness, lying. Even one in Romans talks about being disobedient to parents. And that God will judge these people. That they have no part in the inheritance. They have no part in Christ. Right? So we need to not be making a practice of habitual sin that looks just like the unbelievers who will be judged by God. We need to be separate. Do not live. Look at these lists. Memorize them. And do your best to not live that way. Because that's how unbelievers live. Right? Don't cross that line into acting like an unbeliever as a believer. We need to stay pure. We need to stay holy to the best of our ability through the help of the Holy Spirit. Right? Remember, this is not something that we can do on our own. This is something we need the church for. We need to be in fellowship with believers. We need the re to be saturating ourselves in the Bible. We need to be in prayer, and we need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to do this. Right? Just like um, Paul says in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, but to will and to work, that's what God does in you. So Paul's saying, do this, basically, be holy, live like believers, but also know that the only reason you can do this is because God is working in you, because God is giving you these desires and you have the Holy Spirit to help you. It's a dual process. You need to do something, but also you have the power through the Holy Spirit in order to do these things. Right, and also, this news of judgment isn't new. Paul says, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you, so Paul has warned them of the judgment of God that's to come. Right? This is not the most fun thing about preaching is warning people of the judgment to come. But myself and Pastor Ryan do not want to stand before the Lord one day and have to answer for why I never warned you that sin has judgment. That I never warned you that if you do not place your faith in Christ that there's an eternal hellfire that's waiting. Right? So we need to warn you that there is judgment. There will come a day when you die, when the Lord returns, that you will stand before Jesus Christ and answer for what you've done. Now, if you're a believer, if you have understood that you're in sin, that you're in need of a Savior, right, and you have looked to Christ in faith alone, that His blood covers your sins and pays for your sin, then on that day will actually be a day of rejoicing because your sins are paid for, you're covered. You belong to Christ. You are in Christ and Christ is in you. And there is not judgment waiting for you, but rejoicing and an eternity of worship with other believers and being face to face with the Lord and Savior. And what a bl blessing and amazing thing that is. But if you've never trusted in Christ, if you've never understood that you 
are a sinner deserving of eternal wrath, then all that awaits for you is judgment. On that last day, that's what's coming. There's no avoiding it. Whether you believe in hell or not, whether you believe in God or not, there is a judgment coming. We don't know when that could be. Right? We have no idea when our last day is on this earth. We have no idea when Christ is going to return. But there will come a time of judgment. Paul warned the Thessalonians of this. Pastor Brian has warned you of it. I've warned you of it. Know that it's coming. So let's live in a way that is in sanctification, that is in honor. We should not be living in a way that the unbelievers are living in which they will face this judgment. Then in verse 7 here, we have our calling, this next section. It says, For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. Right? God did not call you, right, this calling talking about your salvation, right, a salvific call. You are not called by God as a believer to live in sin. That is not God's purpose for your life. Right, we see in one of my favorite verses to go to, to illustrate this, is in Romans 8. Right, when we get all this stuff and a lot of times we focus on, well, there's foreknowledge, there's predestination here, and we get so focused on these things, we miss the purpose. Why are you predestined? So that you may be conformed to the image of Christ, of the Son. The purpose of your calling is to be holy. What glorifies God, right? John 15, that you bear fruit. That's what glorifies the Father, that you grow in holiness and sanctification. So Paul makes that very clear here. God has not called you to a purpose of impurity, right? God is not, you can't say, well, you know what? I'm just, I don't have any choice of my own. I'm stuck in this sin, and this just must be God's calling for my life, that I live in perpetual sexual morality, right? Paul's saying, no, God's calling for your life is holiness. It's sanctification. It's not to be stuck in this sin. God doesn't want you to be stuck in sin, right? He set you free from sin. By being stuck in sin, we're basically taking broken shackles and laying them on our wrists and saying, oh no, I'm stuck. When they're broken, the jail cell, the door has been open. The chains have been broken. Sin no longer has power over you. So let's not act like we're still enslaved, right? Shake off the shackles, walk in holiness, walk in the freedom and the liberty of being in Christ. Don't be stuck. Stop putting on broken shackles of being stuck in a sin that you've been set free from. So we need to understand that. One person sums it up this way. He says, the law of God forbids all impurity. And the gospel requires the greatest purity. It calls us from uncleanness into holiness. Right? We're transferred from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into a kingdom of righteousness. It's a complete renewal. It's a complete transfer, a transaction. It's not like we're stuck somewhere in the middle. We've been renewed. We have the Holy Spirit. We've been regenerated. We are a new creation. Right? And we see this, this concept of walk worthy of your calling all throughout the New Testament. Right? We see it in Ephesians. Um, we see it in this text numerous times. In lots of Paul's writings, he talks about how we ought to walk, how we should be living our life, and it's we should be living in a state of holiness. Right? Philippians 1 6, Christ will finish the work he started. He who begins a good work in you will bring it to completion. God is not going to take his hands off you and just leave you to your own sin and to your own flesh. He will be working with you every step of the way when you're falling and when you're being restored. God will be there. He'll be helping. He will be working. He will be renewing you to be further and further conformed to who Christ was. So then in verse 8, this last section, we have God's divine command. So Paul says, so he who rejects this, so the this, right, time for grammar, that this is referring to everything basically Paul's been saying. He who rejects that our purpose is sanctification, that our purpose is holiness, he who says, you know what, I know, Paul, that you say we're supposed to live um, holy. You say this is God's command, but you know what? We're different denominations. You're a Presbyterian. I'm Baptist. So I'm just going to have a little disagreement with you on this, right? This is not a spot where we can have theological disagreement. It's too clear to have disagreement on this text. Now, we're going to talk about some other things within the faith outside of the purview of the gospel. Sure, we can have some disagreements there. But ultimately, this is so clear that no Bible-believing Christian can have a theological disagreement on this. He who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. What is he talking about? Verse 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual morality. There is no cloud around that verse. Right? We don't have to search all the scriptures to find out what does Paul mean when he says abstain from sexual morality. 
It's so clear. And Paul's saying, if you reject this, if you think, well, you know what, I'm just going to have a theological disagreement with Paul on what this means to abstain from sexual morality. Paul says, you're not rejecting man. You're not disagreeing with me. You're disagreeing with God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So if, if you're reading this verse for some reason, you're saying, no, I'm not quite sure you're right on this, Wyatt. You're not, your disagreement's not with me. It's not with Paul. Your disagreement is with God himself who gave the Holy Spirit. Right, so we need to not disagree with God. We need to take this extremely seriously. So that's the first part of this verse is, the call to be holy as a believer is not coming from man, but it's coming from God. So therefore, we need to uphold that. The second thing is, it says God who, and then he notes this, he doesn't say you disagree with God, he says who gives his Holy Spirit to you. The second issue with sin is, when we are sinning, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. We're making an offense against the Holy Spirit, who is all, the third person of the Trinity, who is also God himself, right? We have one being of God, one essence, but is manifest in three persons, okay? So we are offending or we're grieving the Holy Spirit, right? And we see that language in Galatians as well, right? He says, walk in the Spirit that you not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Not only don't just say, oh, I'm going to disagree with God on this, Right? Don't disagree with God on his word, but also don't grieve the Holy Spirit, the one, the helper which God is giving you to dwell within you and to help you live and walk the Christian life. Right? We even, I mean, the book of Proverbs, right, which is from a father to his son, Solomon writing to probably his 13, 14 year old son, Rehoboam, who clearly did not listen to his father's teaching. But also, Solomon was not really living the life that should be exemplified in the book of Proverbs either. But anyways, through the whole book, there's this concept of stay far away from anything that starts to even look like sin. Steer away from it. Don't even go near it. Be separate. Right? So don't think, well, you know, I'm pretty good at possessing my own vessel, so I'm just going to toe the line. Because I know when too far, I know, I know where that line is. Don't toe the line. Steer clear from sin, especially this sin. Because like Augustine said, it tangles so quickly. It infects so quickly. And we see that in the church. The fact that our culture is pervaded with this, the fact that the church struggles with this as a whole on a nationwide standard statistically, clearly towing the line doesn't work. We need to steer clear from this. Also, part of that, um, kind of going into our applications, is we need to be honest with one another. Right? We need to be honest with other believers so that they can help us through this. Now, this doesn't mean come up to the pulpit every Sunday and we're going to have a new member confess all their sins. That's not what this is talking about. Find somebody that you trust within the church that can hold you accountable, that you can text daily, encourage one another, and be held accountable for whatever sin that you're going through. Right? So your question shouldn't be, how far can I go without sinning? Your question should be, how can I possess this body in a way that brings honor to God and the church? How can we glorify God with our actions? Right? If you're in doubt on where that line is, don't go there. Set strict boundaries. Right? Do not um, play with this thing. Even for those who are in relationships, those who are dating, those who are looking forward to marriage, set strict boundaries. I'm not going to tell you specifics what, what's biblical and what's not. But if you're questioning, is this biblical? Is this sexual morality? Is it not? Just don't. Just set it. Just don't. Just don't go there. Right? Second thing, renew your mind with scripture and prayer daily. The more time you're spending in God's word, the more time you're spending in prayer, the more sensitive your conscience is. If you're constantly towing this line and adding worldly things into your life and you're like, ah, Christian liberty, yeah, it is what it is. Your conscience is going to be so seared that you're going to fall into sin and you're going to get so deep and you're going to look around and say, how did this happen? When in reality, there were telltale signs all along the way. But because you have put so much of the world in your life, you can't even tell what that is anymore. Your conscience isn't even pricked by the small sins because it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? It's like drugs or alcohol. You need more and more and more and more. And then you end up ODing or you find yourself in a rehab facility and you say, how did this happen? Right? So be renewing your mind daily in scripture and prayer so that your conscience is sensitive to even the slightest things, the slightest sins. Right? Don't let your body control you. Control your body. 
You have the Holy Spirit. You're set free from sin. Have control over your body. Don't have the mindset of, I'm just too weak. I just can't overcome this. Right? By having that mindset, you have a low view of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has set you free from sin. It's broken the chains. Right? You can walk forward in holiness with the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't have the mindset of, oh, I just can't do it. Have the mindset of, you can do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? These things have been done for you. Walk forward in what Christ has done for you. Right? Like in the Old Testament, Nexus, like Phineas, who there are people living in sin, living in sexual sin, and God sent the plague and it killed lots of people. Phineas saw it. He took a spear and he ran them both through. And God didn't say, oh, you're too harsh, Phineas. He said, finally, a man who is jealous like I am. God says, finally, somebody who understands my heart for sin. And then he blesses him and all his descendants. We need to quickly kill sin when it enters our lives. Not play around with it. Right? Have a high view of sin so that you'll hate it more and kill it quicker. Right? Understand that you are a temple of God, that you are to be, be pure and holy. Meditate in Leviticus. Meditate in God's law so that you have a good picture. You want to see what, what holiness looks like? God's law is, is, should be your guidebook. I mean, Psalm 119, the whole 150 verses of Psalm 119 is all how I love your law. Not how I love your New Testament because it wasn't written. They're saying the first five books of the Bible, the thing that we skip over quickly and say, oh, praise the Lord, I'm done with that and I can move into interesting things. That's what the psalmist is rejoicing to say, I love God's law. It gives me joy, it gives me peace. We need to get back to that as a church where we love God's law, where we can rejoice in those first five books and see holiness, even though that we are not following all those things, right? We don't have the sacrifices and the feasts, right? Because Christ fulfilled those things. But we should still meditate in God's law to see what holiness looks like and to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word. Lord, a, a difficult text that I don't think anybody would willingly pick to preach from, Lord, but um, we know that your word contains all good things. Father, and that as we continue to walk through books verse by verse, that we will have to tackle things we're uncomfortable with. But Lord, it's those things that we're uncomfortable with that will give us the greatest sanctification, draw us closer to you, closer to other believers. Father, and to um, live in further holiness, just as you are holy. Lord, so guide us, help us, help us to be honest with one another, help us to love one another, to help each other through sin. Lord, to, pivot, to possess our body, our vessel, in a way of sanctification, honor, in a way that honors you. Lord, so we're thankful for all that you've done for us. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit, for the gospel, for Jesus Christ. Um, Father, that we're set free from sin. Guide us as we go on from here. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Alrighty, so a good text and kind of in way of a benediction in 1 Thessalonians 5. 23 through 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you. And he also will bring it to pass. You're dismissed.